Hello, Susan Flory back in the saddle with more learning, more inspiration on how to live healthier for longer. It's the big middle back from summer vacay. Now, before we meet our fascinating guest, and he is fascinating, a shout out to Jennifer in Sydney, Mavis in Cape Town, and Panacea Health and Beauty right here in the UK, Surrey, I believe. Thank you so much for your kind donation via my website, susanflory.com. It's a big pink button right there at the top, so I'll click into that if you want to help support this podcast as well. Now, prepare to be amazed and intrigued in turn if you have type 1 diabetes or if you know someone who does. Uh, type 2 diabetes, as we know, is a lifestyle disease. We're learning it can be managed into remission. A hat tip there to Dr. David Unwin, Verta Health, and a number of other primary care practitioners. Type 1 is for life. It always involves varying levels of insulin dosing. Dr. Ian Lake, though, is my guest, and he has shown in remarkable style, I must say, that a low-carb lifestyle can help type 1s manage their disease as well as type 2s. Dr. Ian Lake, thank you so much for being available for this. Hi, Susan. Thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. I'm very uh, excited to be able to tell you some of the findings of our latest project that we've been doing. Yeah, so much work you've been doing. Now, you're a locum general practitioner, a GP here in the UK. That that means a freelance family doctor. Have you spent the day with patients? I spent, uh, yeah, I spent most of the morning uh, doing uh, general practice and then I run a weight management clinic in the afternoon. So lots of variety in my life. And um, I'm very lucky to be in a practice where low carbohydrate lifestyles are routinely uh, part of the, uh, the management uh, of, of our patients. So oh. it's an excellent place to work. Oh, fantastic. And where is that in the UK? That's in Gloucester, uh, southwest of uh, the UK, near Bristol. Yeah, perfect. Now, you have done no end of remarkable work to spread the news that going low carb can help type 1s manage their blood sugar. Let's hear the beginning of your story, because it's, it's good for us to lay in some background. When did you suspect, as a GP, that, oh dear, my my immune system is attacking my pancreas. I fell asleep in a car wash um, and uh, someone knocked on the window and uh, I'd been doing a lot of work, uh, day and night work as a, as a junior doctor. And I just thought I was tired. And um, subsequently I diagnosed myself in the next five hours when I spent most of the time sort of in the loo or drinking profusely. And, and ironically, I had uh, uh, some soda drinks to try to <laughs> to try to quench my thirst, which obviously declared it. So I sort of diagnosed myself on a dipstick test and sort of turned myself in the next day and uh, was started on insulin straight away. And, yeah, and, and were there really any other that. telltale symptoms? You know, were, were, was the exhaustion off the charts where you just sort of died like the Duracell bunny? You just kind of had no more energy? No, it was a straightforward one day I didn't have diabetes the next day I did and there wasn't that much difference in how I felt to be honest I, I was generally tired but that's because I was working quite hard at the time doing you know 100 odd hours a week uh, as a doctor day and night and I just thought that was part of the deal but there's no major um, uh, metabolic change in, in my body and we don't know why the immune system suddenly kicks up no, there are quite a lot of theories, aren't there, as to why diabetes type 1 uh, happens. I mean, there's the, the viral, the virus theory. So several viruses are implicated in type 1. There's vitamin D, lack of vitamin D. There's, there's milk proteins. There's um, uh, wheat intolerance. There's quite a lot of, um, and, and to a small extent, a genetic component. So it's a multifactorial uh, condition. Had so anyone had the condition? Exactly why. Had anyone had the condition in your family? I've, I've got a history in my family of type 2 diabetes, but not type 1. And you were how old? I was 35 at the time, so I've had it for 26 years now. Wow. So it's a bit of a shock to, to get it at that late stage, really. So I, I'm technically a, a 1.5 or a LADA, as they call it, a latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood. And it, it marks a, a massive change in your lifestyle, isn't it? From one day to the next, you suddenly have to deal with this. And it always involves immediately taking insulin. This is quite a shock and quite an embarrassment, really, is how little I knew of day-to-day uh, -day management of this disease, even though I was a, a practicing general practitioner at the time. In type 1 is main, mainly uh, managed in secondary care in hospitals. 
but uh, it was a completely steep learning curve for myself and and a huge shock to think that uh, you know 20 25 years down the line i might be starting to head for sort of the, the complications i see every day as part of managing diabetes and had so you it wasn't already, a very nice prospect no not at all and had you already no. developed a specialism in type 2 diabetes through, through your work as a gp i i think all gps are specialists in type 2 to be honest yeah. it's so prevalent now isn't it it's so prevalent five to ten percent of the population have type 2 diabetes probably more it's just a routine part unfortunately of our, of our management of uh, of that condition it's a routine part of general practice and that was um you said 26 years ago and yeah um, I, it's much worse now isn't it it's as if as if everyone is walking around either with type 2 not type 1 which is what you have the autoimmune attack but type 2 which is the more we know about it, it is a lifestyle disease, progressive lifestyle disease, which we are learning can be uh, reversed, can be put into remission. And we're seeing more and more of it now. Little kids, I was talking to my GP the other day, and she said the youngest that she's seen is three with type two, not type one. That's unheard of in my early days as a doctor. And thankfully, it's, it's rare at the moment. But it is reversible and I, I think the push should be not to get people with type 2 diabetes into type 1 clinics but the push should be to reverse type 2 diabetes in every one of those children which is really possible easily possible to do yeah well the message got that the emphasis message, wrong mm. that message for type 2 is starting to get out there but back to you and your type 1 story when you were self-diagnosed you confirmed it and suddenly your life is looking <clears throat> completely different than what it was and your food choices have to change and everything um did you did you follow the standard of care at the time and and just go okay i'm going to eat anything i want all the sugary carbs i i fancy insulin is my friend it's going to take care of it at the other end and um i'm just wondering how long was it before you you started questioning is this the only way to go yeah i strongly believed in what i was taught and, and why not um so for the first 20 years of my um, diagnosis i pretty well went down what's called the Daphne route. Daphne stands for Dose Adjustment for Normal Eating. And it's an education program for people with type 1 to teach them how to manage their insulin around carbohydrates. Um, so I didn't do that well. And my overall level of control, nothing to really be proud of. Um, in fact, it was most of the time it was nudging the normal end of what was then the guideline amount of um, 7.5 percent or 56 millimoles per mole that's the hba1c and as you know that's the measure of long-term control of your diabetes and that's sort of directly related to complications or the chances of you getting complications so i was nudging the top end of that range and i've subsequently found um, that if you have an hba1c above 7.5 percent um you take 100 days off your life for every year you have an HbA1c above that. And the statistics for England and Wales, based on the uh, National Diabetes Audit, are that 60% of the UK population of people with type 1 are in that bracket. So, so, so why do they have the thresholds so high then? I mean, why don't they lower those threshold levels? So the recommended threshold, yeah, the recommended threshold is 48 millimoles per mole. I think that's 7% mm. in, in um, American terms. Um, but looking at the, the audit, fewer than 10% of people with type 1 meet that target, uh, which is awful, really. Gosh, so um, you were you were among, you were in, in, in um, company that was, was massive because nobody seems to be able to to manage their blood sugar levels by guessing yeah. at insulin dosing and constant finger pricking. And I guess now a lot of people are on insulin pumps. Yeah, about I think it's not that many in the UK, about 15% are on insulin pumps, more children. But um, the, the key thing was, it's just difficult to manage insulin and carbohydrates together. It's, it's an almost impossible job. I mean, I'm not stupid. Um, but I couldn't do it at all. But the, the problem is some people can, and, and the 10% that can, they always turn up at a clinic. And of course, they're model citizens in the diabetes world. And of course, people say, well, well, they can do it, Ian, why, why can't you do it? <laughs> if you well, see what I mean. So there's a lot of self-blame. Sort of 
did you have some sort of an addiction to, you know, heaving plates of pasta? And you would just think, oh, I'll just have to, to give myself more insulin. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was definitely that. It was definitely count your carbs, estimate your carbs, and just, just shoot up a few units extra of insulin and, and see what happens. And of course, you get the roller coaster glucoses. But it, it, never, it never occurred to me to think that there's another way of doing it because that's what we all do, you know, and that's still the guideline recommendations even now. Children now are being recommended that lifestyle as we speak. Well, it's sort of like, from what I understand, and my understanding is only superficial, um, you, you don't have to change anything. It's, it's literally just grab the insulin and try to get really good at understanding how much insulin you need to count against, you know, how, how big that lump of baked potato or mashed potatoes you had on your plate was. And it can be, the thing is, your body doesn't just react to the insulin, does it? There are other other forces at play and you can end up having a hypo in the middle of the night which can be life-threatening absolutely yeah i mean with a, a low carbohydrate diet which i'll come on to later it is well known that people have up to five times fewer hypos on that diet compared with people on a, a normal lifestyle diet so uh, is everything to play for really with diabetes management and my hope is that one day everyone will have the information about ketogenic low carb diets which will revolutionize their life as it has done mine so i'm really hoping that what we can do with going out on podcasts and just putting information out there and doing experiments is that one day people will say well this is a valid option for us and it will change my life for the better well a book was pivotal a certain book was pivotal in getting you to rethink yeah. how you were mismanaging your blood sugar yeah. levels tell mm. us about mm. that book well i I was just casting around for information on diabetes and came across Richard Bernstein's Diabetes Solution, which is sort of considered the sort of Bible for people with type one. I read it from cover to cover in fascination, put it down for a year thinking, mm, that's OK, but it's a bit faffy and there's quite a lot of fat in that. So being a person brought up on the low fat diet, um, I put it down and then I started getting quite difficult things like postural hypotension so standing up and feeling very dizzy that was happening five six times a day and it was severe it was taking 15 20 seconds to recover from that what so while you were um, at work for instance you would have to stop. yeah just stand up and boom you, you know it's quite difficult um <laughs> as you can imagine joint aches and pains was pain was starting to become part of my normal life and just just generally feeling old and tired foggy vision i'd had a couple of really bad hypos where I, I woke up with an ambulance personnel sort of rescuing wow. me, as it were. Wow. And then the crucial thing for me was that I ended up getting very early stages of retinopathy. And, and what is know, that? No, Your vision just starts getting blurry or? Well, no, you get because of the constant high sugar levels in your blood, the, um, it's toxic to, to the blood vessels and you can see it in the retinal tissue. So you start to get small bleeds in the eye, uh, things like exudates, it affects the vision eventually. And people do go blind and have retinal detachments and all sorts of things as a result of poorly controlled diabetes. And most people end up at some point having laser treatment. So that was a little bit of a wake up call. So I revisited Richard Bernstein and um, I, I started from day one on a very strict keto diet. I still remember my first three egg omelette fried in butter, thinking <laughs> I shall have a stroke by lunchtime if I carry on like this. Well, I like everyone, have, you'd been brainwashed. Yeah. I mean, we've had 60 yeah. years of do not eat butter, do not eat absolutely, fat. Absolutely, absolutely. But from that moment, my blood sugar trace was flat oh, and wow. it's never looked back. And for the last six years, my, my blood sugar control has been such that I haven't ever been in the diabetes range for long-term control. And what is so it? Is I'm, it even lower than... That. That's fantastic. But is it, is it even lower? Are you in the pre-diabetic range or, or completely out okay. of it? occasionally in the pre-diabetic range and about half the time out of it completely right so my best my best effort was 37 which is uh, about five and a half that's great most of them are around about 40 which is just nudging 5.8 something like that some people do a lot better than myself i'm sort of a little bit more relaxed about it if you like but i, I do try really hard the, the biggest thing for me was a continuous glucose meter i think that should almost be compulsory for people with type 1 Right. Not too worried about the insulin delivery system. If you're not particularly brittle, uh, certainly on a keto diet, you can get away with, with pens. And I use pens 
the reason I use pens is I sort of go out in sympathy with my my readership because ninety percent of those in England are on pens. Right. So I think well, I'll, I'll I'll report about what it's like on a pen. Okay. <laughs> so that's yeah. just a finger prick that comes in the form of a pen. The, the pen is yeah, you just inject it into your leg or into your abdomen, just inject the insulin into the into the tissues subcutaneous. Whereas with a pump, you can so you get your the level via the, the pump. And then you use the pen as the injector. No, I don't use a pump at all. Oh, I just right. use pens. So you inject long acting insulin and, and rapid acting insulin. Whereas with a pump, you have rapid acting insulin and control the amount that's flowing in over a 24 hour period. Well, I remember in, I've had Prof Tim Noakes, a celebrated sports scientist, as you know, from South Africa. I know you know him well. I've had him on the show three times. And I remember the first, one of the first interviews we did a couple of years back. He had said, and I thought, oh boy, here's more controversy. Uh, he said, he was telling me why he advocates a once a day insulin injection for what he termed properly controlled type one diabetics. And are you as much as low as that once a day? Is, is that what you do? No, I, no I'm not. I, I, um, Richard Bernstein's slightly different on that. And he would say you split your insulin into small volumes. So you, you have less risk of um, errors with, with the, um, with the insulin so i i can inject my insulin once a day but it will be quite difficult for me to control my diabetes even though i only eat a maximum of twice a day i i find it gives me more fine control if i inject small amounts more often so i inject only inject twice possibly three times a day mostly twice a day and that gives me the control i need and because we have this of thing reading... in the sorry go ahead uh, with, with a keto diet, you, you use such small volumes of insulin that you get a lot of safety because you're not going to plummet your blood glucose very quickly just because of the small amount of insulin on board. So every unit of insulin will reduce your blood sugar by about two to three millimoles per litre. And that's multiply that by 18 for grams per deciliter in, in America. So that's about 20, isn't it? Something like that. Uh, no, 35 or something. Yeah. And um, so if you're injecting just one or two units, you'll only reduce your blood glucose a small amount. But if you're injecting 10 units, as you would for a, a typical West, a typical high carb diet, of course, you've got potential if you don't feed yourself with carbs right. to have quite bad crushing hypos. Well, let's talk grams now, because the average UK diet, which is very similar to the SAD diet, the standard American diet, and for much of the you know, the Anglo-Saxon world, all of the, the major OECD countries are on the same sort of eating regimes. It's, it's pretty much 250 to 350 grams yeah. of carbs a day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. strict keto is 20 to 30. So yeah. where are you then in terms of your daily ingestion of carbohydrates that you can manage with so, so little insulin? I'm on the strict keto end. Uh, for my website, I did a, um, a two week diet trying to eat as cheaply as possible because keto is often associated with an expensive sort of diet, isn't it? Expensive shopping list. And I, man I managed to get it down to uh, less than 10 pounds less um, than the average spend per person in the UK. So it's 28 pounds 50 a week for two weeks. And I just bought what I normally buy and it came out to an average of 30 grams a day. So that's where I am. And that's Actually, a mix yeah. of what kind of macros then? So you're eating meat, seafood, vegetables, very little vegetables? No, lots of vegetables. I'm, 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 I do eat a lot of meat, but I'm quite, eat quite a few vegetables as well. A little bit of dairy, quite a lot of eggs, those sorts of foods. Fish goes, you know, two, three days a week, probably. Tins of pilchards Some, or sardines, mackerel? Well, I tend not to, but yes, they're, they're, they're eminently possible on a keto diet. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a varied diet, but I only eat twice a day and I, I fast for 16 hours pretty well every day because for me, it suits my diabetes. And uh, that's one of the difficulties that clinicians find in managing type one, because they always say, if you're taking insulin, you've got to have carbs. And of course, if you're taking the right amount of insulin for your body, you don't actually strictly need carbohydrates. Well, this is the point. That you, well, this is the point that you and others make. It's, it's not essential. You can live on fat and protein. Your body will make the carbs that you need, the glucose Absolutely. that you need. So Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a myth that we actually need carbs, but we live in a world where they're just being pounded into us and around us at at, at every turn. Absolutely, and I, I think with with insulin, I mean, we have to take insulin. You know, type ones have to take insulin. So it's not an option for us. 
but you only need the, the right amount of insulin to cover the, the uh, effect of raised glucose due to stress hormones, which is driven by glucagon, of course. So that will raise your blood glucose. And when you go keto, you start to find that you're fighting against your stress hormones more than you're fighting against your food because you have the food sort of pretty well sorted in the fact that you know how much how many grams of carbs you're taking you know how much insulin you're taking most of the day i don't even bother about my diabetes it's completely normal uh control uh and then you just have to bolus your insulin for for your food just twice a day so it's dead easy but the effect of waking up if you're a bit stressed you haven't had much sleep that kicks your blood glucose up and that has to be managed well, as you say, the management is multifactorial. The cause is multifactorial and unknown, big unknowns in there. And, and the management of it, it's not, just, it's not just matching your macros to insulin injection. It's sleep, stress, all of that. All of the lifestyle factors that we're, we're yeah. learning are so mm -hmm. important to have mm -hmm. that you know, optimal health cocktail that we're all seeking, even if you are type 1, which, which as I said at the outset, you know, it is for life. It's, we're learning about type two, that can be a chronic lifestyle disease, sort of the, the gateway disease, it seems to the full suite of metabolic syndrome issues. Um, I want to zoom forward to your 05100 fasted challenge, because that is fascinating. You staged it nearly a year ago, so it's a wonderful time to take the measure of it, to take stock of, of what it was, what you achieved. Uh, so first tell us what it was, and then we can explore the impact. Yeah, well, the Zero Five One Hundred project was dreamed up, um, uh, and it's basically zero is zero calories, five is five days, and 100 is 100 miles. So we set out to, to run 100 miles or run walk 100 miles. It didn't really matter uh, because we wanted to use up 20 to 25,000 calories of energy from fat. So the, 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 the whole rationale behind this was people stand up in meetings and say, oh, well, you've got 25,000 calories of fat ready to go. You don't need to eat. And we thought, well, people are saying that. And in theory, it's true. But is it actually true in practice? So. We wanted to set out and say, yes, it is. So I can actually stand up and say the same thing as everybody else uh, with, with confidence and, and with, assur with assuredness. Um, so we wanted to cover 25,000 calories and we, we felt that 100 miles is, is a nice number. To, to That's the number you have to go for to achieve that amount of fat burning. Uh, so that's a zero and the 100. And we thought that we'd take it over five days because most people can manage a two or three day fast. So we thought we'd take it right to the extreme. Uh, that would mean we didn't have to cover too, ma too many miles a day, 20 miles a day, which was manageable. Even if you had to walk, you'd finish at the end of the day. And, um, and, and it would sort of put beyond doubt the idea of intermittent fasting. So if a type, person with type one diabetes, and there were two of us on, on, the, uh, on the trip, if a person with type one diabetes can not eat for five days, then it's quite likely that anyone else with type 1 diabetes can, miss, can skip breakfast. Because at the moment, a lot of people are being told they have to have their three meals a day plus snacks to manage their type 1 diabetes. And I thought, well, that is just not right. And how can we actually show that it's not right? And we thought, well, let's take, take it to the absolute extreme to show that it isn't right. So and, and did, you, other... did you think this up? This is your brainchild. Yeah, I dreamt it up just before Christmas, the year before. And, it, you know, that Christmas and New Year period where you sort of have crazy ideas and <laughs> you should leave them in the pub or you should leave them. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it then became tantalising that is it possible to do it? Because I didn't actually know whether it was possible to do it. But I thought, well, it probably is based on my other experiences of, uh, you know, I did a 700 mile run the year before, but that was with a keto diet. And I thought, well, it, I'm sure it's possible to burn fat without actually having to consume it because it's your, your, your tank of energy, you see, is not your stomach. Your tank of energy is your fat or your glycogen, which is used for anaerobic activities. Uh, so we thought, well, you've got all this fat on board. Let's experiment to see if we can use it. So and, you, and, it was uh, you, you were one of eight and there yes. were two type one diabetics yes. on board. And yeah. so what did you find? Like, how did the runs go? Were you, you know, out of the gate, full of vim and vigor and not flagging at all? I mean, what was it like day one, day two, day four? Yeah, it was remarkably easy. 
we, we had trained a lot because COVID had intervened and we had to take a break. So we, we, we managed to do a lot of fasting. Uh, so we got used to what it felt like not to be hungry for the first 24 hours. And actually after the first 24, 48 hours, you, do, you don't really feel hungry at all anyway. Uh, my worst day was day three. Uh, my best day was day four. And I felt I could have run all day on day four. And I did run most of the day. And I thought I could run the extra. We had 12 miles to finish. It's just where we ended up. And uh, it was full of energy. But the remarkable thing about this was that everybody was full of energy. And, and if you look on the, on the paper, at the, at the paper, uh, hunger wasn't an issue for any of us. One or two people started to get about hungry on day five, I think, in anticipation of, the, of breaking the fast. And the, but the mood in everyone was really, really upbeat all the way along. There are no arguments. There's no tiredness. In fact, we had a, a consultant psychiatrist come to see us. Uh, she was a specialist in eating disorders. So she was used to, to sort of starvation, unfortunately, as part of her job. And she couldn't really believe how well we looked on the, the last night before our final push. We were all fit as, fit as fiddles, really. We were completely fit and but really you had, fired up. you had up. trained yourselves to be fat adapted. You yes. were sugar burners only when you ate yeah. sugar. So you were metabolically flexible. And I, I read yeah. in one of the articles about this, I mean, it was what military precision planning, <laughs> seven months of it and all kinds of mock maneuvers out there. And the thing that really interested me is you were really quiet about it. Um, you didn't do it with a lot of fanfare, but somehow what you were doing leaked out and then wow, the abuse, you got whacked with it. And everybody's saying it was daft and and gratuitous PR stunt, that sort of thing. How did you deal with that? We were sort of ready for it and we expected it. Um, and that's really why we kept it quiet, because I didn't really want the extra pressure of, of failing, if you see what I mean. Because if people say you're going to fail, you're going to fail, it's stupid, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, the pressure's on not to do it. Um, but we decided to do it anyway. Uh, I genuinely didn't know whether I would do it, to be honest, whether I'd complete it. And none of us really knew what, what would happen. We thought it would work quite well. And by the time we got to the start line, we were all pretty confident it would be okay. So I genuinely didn't know as a type one whether I'd do it. I have a little bit of a profile as a keto advocate. So I didn't really want to ruin everything for everybody by sort of spectacularly failing. So we thought we'll keep it quiet, we'll finish it, and then we will we'll publish the information afterwards and see what we can come up with. Did you have to take any glucose tablets or glucose gel or I any took of that them, at all? Yeah, I did. I took 78 calories of glucose, which is about six glucose tablets over five days. That's it. My sugar, my glucose went a bit low on once at night. I thought I better rescue that one at night because I didn't want to, to have any problems. And twice during the, the, the run, it just dipped low because of trying to manage your insulin down. My insulin went from about 18 to 20 units a day down to four units a day during parts of the run, which is interesting, isn't it? Because you think, well, why do I need so little insulin when I'm fasting? Because I've got the same background stresses on my body. So that's the next project, probably looking at why insulin requirements decrease in a fast. Yeah, that's I mean, revelatory yeah. and definitely yeah. deserves more exploration. I mean, this yeah. is clearly the way forward. But what has the general feedback been within the medical community? It's to me, it's been very disappointing so far. We've, we've finally got the paper out only you know, recently in, in August. And, that's and this been is favorable. the medical paper and it's open access. It is published. Open Where can access. we find we, it? That, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link to that. But it's it's in uh, it's on my website, type1keto.com, and it's the number one. And um, type1keto.com, and you look at 0, 05, 100, it's all on there. And you can find and the, the journal, paper. it was published in peer reviews. It's the Journal of Obesity, Diabetes, and Endocrinology. Okay, and you're, you're the sole author. I, I did scan it very quickly today, yeah. um, I must say. Yeah. Um, I didn't have yeah. long to prepare for this, but um, <laughs> I, I just, so it hasn't had the, the impact. It hasn't changed the, the game as much as you would have liked. It, it hasn't changed the game because unfortunately at the moment I've, I've written to, I, I'm spending the next two months writing to every hospital doctor in the country who specializes in diabetes. So at least they know 
because I think there's a lot of people who don't know anything about the keto diet. Um, but I've written to all of the major charities in, in England and I haven't had any response from them at all so far, so, which I think is a little bit disappointing because Hugely. the paper itself is it. Well, the paper itself is in the 97th centile of, of, of papers published at the same time. Right. So it's a popular paper, but it hasn't been picked up by any of the major charities uh, in the UK, which I find is a bit disappointing. So its influence is limited, of course, because it's, it, the knowledge is being suppressed at the moment. And what about well, suppressed or I don't know whether it's suppressed or not. It's just not probably not. Well, the right people word. are reading it and probably fascinated, but they're frightened to go there because it, yeah. it goes against the grain of the yeah. orthodoxy so very much. So we're getting good uptake with type one. Seventy eight percent of the readership so far are type one. So 14 percent of clinicians. So we're, we're making progress slowly. And you also, I understand, did a film about this. Is, is that got a film still or? It's, it's it's well it's in the can but it's not actually been edited properly so we, we, we may get it out or may not that's sort of out of my hands but uh, we'll try to get something out on it we've got short intro films on it and they're on the website so a little bit of fun right very interesting and we should mention too that you kind of had um, a celebrity amongst you a former olympian who was one of the eight in the group and and he of course um generated a bit of attention yeah, it was good. James joined us very late. Uh, he was uh, James Cracknell. He was a, James Cracknell. I'm sorry, James Cracknell, double Olympic medal rower from the 19 from the 2000s, I think. Uh, he's still a celebrity, as you know, in the UK. He does a lot of stunty sort of uh, TV sort of uh, action stuff, right. and uh, he was relatively. He was very much a carb convert, and of course, at the top level sport, you can make a strong argument for using carbs for energy. Mm -hmm. because carbs will go straight into the muscle and it may be that at his level that 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 is quite a useful thing to do but he he wholeheartedly took part in this and and by the end of the five days he sort of got it he got he understood what we're doing and why we're doing it and his body adapted quite well uh to the keto diet so it didn't take him long to actually convert but he's super and, fit it's james yeah. yeah and of the other runners uh over the the five day fasted zero calorie no eating challenge. Um, are they all continuing to, to, to spread this sort of news? Type one Absolutely. and type two for, for all diabetics, really? Yeah, we, we, we've got we, we have quite a few sort of people in medicine. We've got Trudy Deakin, who's uh, head of expert patient program. Um, she's keto. She's been keto for a long time. Gail Gary, who's a practice nurse in, in Solihull. I have a couple of businessmen who are running a, a low carb website. I have a fellow type one who's uh, trying to get into this space. So he's promoting himself uh, a lot. And we ha also uh, have a consultant psychiatrist in eating disorders, which is a, an extremely uh, beneficial thing for us because we were quite badly criticized that this was promoting eating disorders. So luckily we had a psychiatrist who was on the eating disorders wards who could uh, provide the answers for us. Well, you did say that, that your paper actually showed some positives for eating disorders. Could you develop that thought for me? Yes, well, you know, you get talking, don't you? And the thing about the ketogenic diet is that it gives a certain amount of euphoria. Uh, so you're always feeling good. And, and the, uh, the thought is that ketones in the brain uh, are really good food for the brain. Uh, so you get this euphoria. And, you know, the idea, the sort of concept is that if, if people decide they're going to not eat for whatever reason, they will then get this euphoria as a result of not eating. And to some degree, that will justify their decisions not to eat because they'll feel good about it. And of course, when they go to get refed, they often get refed high carbohydrate meals. And of course, that takes away that euphoria, increases bloating in the stomach, and it's sort of counterproductive to therapy so there, there is a school of thought that says well why don't we rehab these people on on sort of protein and fat and maintain that euphoria but also build up their muscle mass and build up their their energy source through fat and that oh. may have value but that's that's early thinking and whether or not that will translate into practice is difficult to know well i guess your paper it's a thought to... isn't it yeah, mm. the 3% who haven't read it need to read it and adopt yes. it and start to yes. put it into practice. <laughs> I you hope know? so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my goal is that every person with type 1 has this information and should they choose to use it, that's entirely up to them. But it's, it's nothing worse than, than having uh, complications, not knowing that there are alternatives for you. 
Well, it's an option, as you stress mm. all along in all of the articles mm. you've written and in the medical mm. paper. It's it's not the mm. only tool in the box. It's just something mm. to add that you might want to try. But wouldn't you think that, you know, the average parent of the average small you know, young person who is diagnosed because type one is is often diagnosed, you know, three years old, five years old, all of a sudden um, Johnny or Jill has it. Uh, or your classmate has it, don't you think that a lot of parents would put up a lot of resistance? They would just be looking to their GP to put their child on the, the usual standard of care where insulin will manage that big wadge of cake that they have at the birthday party. That's the general uh, way it works at the moment. And of course, if your child's being saved by the people that then recommend the diet for you, you will do anything you possibly can to, to do your best for them. You'll give your pancreas up for your child. Um, and so, you know, the first the first meal that the child has is, is sets a standard for the long term outcome for that child, unless parents find, think there's another way or hear of another way of doing it. Well, are parents but, yes. seeking you out? Are they are they beating a path to your door? Yeah, jibs and drabs. There's, there's, there are a few, a few people trying to find out. Yeah, I've got, I've got a steady flow of, of people, but it, it's it's um, it's not big at the moment. We're hoping to make it bigger. And how are you planning to do that? Is there is there a campaign in the pipeline? Well, um, my website sort of um, is getting noticed, um, but also I'm hoping the paper is going to spread through the medical community and. Um, and so my aim is to make sure that ignorance isn't an option because every consultant will have this on their desk. Um, so at least they will know about it. Um, and, and I hope gradually, gradually the conversation will happen and, and things will change. But diabetes is an industry, um, you know, and, and what we're doing is, is doesn't fit into that industrial model at the moment. Yeah. You know, we're halving volumes of insulin. We're reducing admissions due to uh, hypos fivefold. We are hopefully reducing the incidence of, of diabetic eye disease, of renal disease, of heart attacks and strokes. And, and there's no money to be made in real food. It's just, it's just nothing to be made. So, you know, industries work on an ecosystem which relies on a supply chain, doesn't it? So yes. being, it's being a bit cynical, but, but I, I, I think we need to change that model. And, uh, and I think the change will come from the ground up rather than top down. Absolutely. So we're hoping just to keep promoting it through things like this podcast and through Twitter and through websites and, and just keep in the media as much as we can. Yeah, it's it's always, you know, spreading the news, talking amongst ourselves, mm. learning from one another and and mm. hopefully little by little. I mean, it's the same with low carb, high fat, medium fat for type two diabetics. I mean, the mm. Dr. David Unwin and others, Verta Health, as I mentioned earlier, they're making huge gains in showing mm. here's the mm. evidence. We mm. have got evidence for you now. It's not just N equals one and stories. Mind you, though, you put up an amazing um comparison photo just before we go tell me about gina gina's amazing gina roberts lives in utah she runs a website called resoluteketo.com uh, her store is on the website but she uh, developed diabetes as a result of having had to have her pancreas removed uh, as a result of infection and um, so she went straight on to usual type one treatment and ended up gaining masses and masses of weight um, uh, and she had something called systemic lupus erythematosus or lupus, which requires lots of uh, immunosuppressant drugs, one of which is, is a steroid, which of course makes the diabetes worse, which puts on weight. And she had cardiac problems, she could barely move, and uh, her, her cardiologist actually said, why don't you try a keto diet? And she was already on about 75 grams of carbs and went down to 20. And within weeks, it revolutionized her life. And uh, she lost something like 11 stones in weight, which is 140, 150, 160 pounds in weight. It's an uh, amazing comparison photo. It's just, you see yeah. it and just go, wow, if she yeah. can do that. And, and yeah. the, you know, it's not all about weight loss for everyone. It's, you know, optimizing your health and, and coping with a very tricky disease. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so Gina's as well worth looking up. Yeah. yeah, and she's, you had a tweet about her. On Twitter, you are, what's your handle? At ID Lake. Okay, and your website is type1keto.com. Yeah. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, Dr. Ian Lake, I cannot thank you enough for doing this. Uh, the learning never stops on the big myth, <laughs> which is just the way we like it. And onward ho with your work. Best of luck in in amplifying the message in the many ways that you're trying to do so. And, and hopefully, I mean, little by little, grassroots, bottoms up, um, people are waking up to it. And, you know, thanks to the internet. And as you say, thanks to podcasts like this and the articles you're writing and the paper, which is really a fascinating read. So um, thanks again. Really appreciate you coming on The Big Middle. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me. That is all she wrote for this episode of the show. Uh, bar the usual caveat, of course, uh, you have heard information about things medical. Um, these are opinions, some information, but opinions in the main. And what you've heard should not be construed as medical advice. Your personal doctor is where you go to get that. So with that, I say go well. Until next time, bye-bye.